welcome everyone. You're listening to Heart of Mind Radio for the New Millennium. I'm Katherine Davis. And on today's program, we have a very special live guest joining us all the way from Australia, Winfred Sethoff. And he is the author of a new book called The Friendship Key to Lasting Peace, United Communities, Stronger Relationships, Equality, and a better job. So that really covers so much of our concerns. And Dr. Sethoff, in his early 20s, faced a life-threatening personal crisis that sent him into self-imposed isolation. Over a 12-month internal quest, he discovered not only answers to his crisis, but uncovered a sense of genuine self a journey he documented in his first book, A Balance of Self, A New Approach to Self-Understanding. And we are going to be talking to him, of course, about his newest book. And um, I'm really excited about that. And his books convey his passion for history, tribal society, ethnography, psychology, and self-understanding. All of this to prevent us from making the same mistakes over and over, showing how when we look back in history, reflect, we can prevent old and new mistakes from happening again and again. And I would say that we definitely need that here in the United States. And I want to say thank you so much and welcome, Dr. Setoff. Thank you, Catherine. It's so nice to have you. And maybe you can... Tell us a little bit more, go into more depth about what happened with your personal journey and how it was that you took um, sort of a a side passageway from what you would normally have just coasted into. Yeah, no, that's that's true. Um, So I was, well, I suffered from depression probably through most of my high school and university years and for... For the listeners who may not know what depression is, it's not like your normal sadness. Depression, as doctors tend to define it, is more of like a sadness that's so deep that you can't really get out of, and it goes on for for weeks, months, and usually affects most of your life. So for me, I was so down most of the time, not knowing why, um, that I was thinking of just ending it all okay, on a regular basis. Um, often my beliefs at the time suggested if I did, then I could be worse off, so I kind of didn't do that. Um, but then by the end of my medical training, when I actually started to get some time to myself because I was working long hours and studying long hours, as you can imagine doctors tend to do, um, I started noticing, yeah, I was feeling pretty bad and I thought, okay, well, I need to do something about this because the future looked to me pretty grim, even though I was an, in a promising career and I could have become a specialist, I had all these people supporting me. I thought, look, this isn't going to really satisfy me. There are whole parts of my life I just feel like I just couldn't satisfy. So I said, okay, well, look, I need to make some choices here. So I decided, okay, um, I could end it all, and I thought about that, but that I thought might be a bit of a waste. Um, I thought I could live my life the way I was, and that probably wasn't going to be very good, or I could take the chance, isolate myself for a while, and see if I could get this deeper sense of all-knowing um, I thought if I could get that sort of sense, because I sort of read about it, that it might be possible, I thought if I could go inside myself, maybe I could find the answers to what I was after, some sense of self I could truly believe in, some sort of sense of truth. And so, yeah, I isolated myself in a one-bedroom unit, went out for getting food once every two weeks, sat on a bed most of the time with a pillow on my back against a concrete wall, and sort of struggled inside myself to find out who I was, facing, as you can imagine, all the fears and pains and everything that shows up. And, yeah, that's how I tried to work out who I was. And eventually, yeah, even after three months, I actually found something that I was pretty close to what I was after. So my question is, do you feel that this is something that most people face and somehow um, push it under the rug? Or is there something some quality that you had that made you have to face this sort of existential internal crisis? Well, that's actually a good question because now that I work as a GP and focus on mental health, I see a lot of people struggling with this. I mean, we often call it a personal crisis, 
Um, I see a lot of people struggling with that. And even more than that, I see a lot of us who are just living slightly unhappy lives. Um, there's a hollowness inside us that is missing. There's something we know that's just not right about our life. Um, often we end up trying to then cope with lots of different ways to make ourselves feel better. But then even when we start to cope and do all these things, there's still something deep inside we know is missing. And so I wanted to know what that was. And um, um, after a while, I actually got a fair idea. And now I use those basic ideas to help people get out of depression themselves and also, more importantly, try to prevent it. And I think that's really important on a, an individual basis that we each find our way to, through that kind of crisis. I certainly have experienced something similar. But what I find also very interesting about your work is that it's so expansive in terms of bringing in um, a historical context and really looking at humanity from a broad vantage point. And so I really do want to touch on that, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And look, if you'd told me this 20 years ago that I was going to get involved in any of this, I probably would have laughed you off. Um, but as I started to learn some of the basics of who we are, which is a model of understanding our basic humanity and desires, and then started to apply it to um, history, how we became who we became, um, what, why we do what we do, basically from understanding deep inside what drives us. Man, I was surprised. I couldn't believe what I was coming across. And then it started to all make a lot of sense. But it also then started to show that, hold on a second, what we're doing isn't really working very well. And yet in the past, I learned a lot of our tribal ancestors, for instance, they actually had a, some pretty good ways of dealing with life and, and sorting out their stuff. So... It was quite a journey to understand how this all fitted together. Absolutely. And so what, what is it that's inside that drives us that you've discovered? Yeah, so look, um, I basically came up with a model that kind of understands oppression, and I break it into what I call basic human desires. And the model is called a balance of self model, and it's, I pretty much use it in all of the books I write about. And it's a summary of all the desires that we have as human beings so we can survive out in the natural world like desires for hunger, thirst, need for shelter, having families, community, that kind of stuff. And so what I've found is if we tend to satisfy those desires, we tend to feel pretty good. And if we think we're going to satisfy them, we feel pretty good. But if we don't, we don't feel that great at all. And within those are what I call community self-desires, which uh, it took me a while, but I eventually learned that really they're just friendship desires. They're just desires that we have so that we can be with each other form close groups, so we know people who have got our backs, so, you know, all those warm, loving people that we have that we know that we really need to be with. And so eventually I learned that those desires are actually just friendship desires, and they form the foundation for the friendship key. And then later on I started learning, hold on a second, what went wrong? Because when we were tribal, we had all these great friends. We were feeling pretty good. I mean, people keep saying that we're supposed to have been going to war a lot as tribal people. But if you look back through history, there are a lot of tribal areas where that didn't happen really at all and people were living pretty well. And so I had to try and make sense, okay, what changed? And then I came up, uh, looked back and found, hold on, there were actually some desires there that were very, very destructive. And that's what I write about at the beginning of the book. And um, I was really surprised by those because they affect our relationships, they tear us apart in relationships and families and they affect our economy, our governments, and man, they are really giving us a hard time right now. That is true. And, and in your book, in part one, it, it, you title it The Friendship Crash and Rise of a Beast. And I thought that was really interesting because um, that does seem to describe what has happened to our civilization. And one of the things that <clears throat> is never really dealt with in the United States specifically, maybe true throughout the Americas, I don't know, is that nobody wants to face the, the uh, unfortunate, unfortunate history and past of, um, you know, decimation of the tribal Aboriginal peoples of these lands and how um, our whole society is kind of built over that, but it feels like a crumbling structure within, within which to build our society. Oh, look, I completely agree. And in Australia, we've had a similar problem because the British came over here and they pretty much wiped out most of the Aboriginal population here as well. Um, it's an interesting arrogance that the West had 
but it was also one that's very understandable when you understand what was driving them. Um, they ultimately were driven largely by what we could summarize as greed. And it's a matter of understanding what that greed was. But, I mean, they had whole armies and they had forces that were going everywhere, taking over native tribal people and saying that these people were so primitive that they had no rights, um, that they were literally going in there and decimating them. In Australia, for instance, it was regarded as terra nullis or terra nullius, which basically meant um, the people weren't didn't own anything so that the Europeans could come along and take whatever they wanted, um, which was absolutely crazy. And then all these lovely civilizations that were living, or country, a lot of civil, a lot of um, tribal societies that were living very peacefully, um, were then treated very poorly. I look, I, I mean, I wrote when I wrote my second book, which was about um, women. I looked a lot into tribal societies to see how they how they survived, and I learnt. But yeah, look, there were some of them that lived for hundreds of years that highly valued and respected women that were living very, very peacefully for long periods of time. Um, everyone was living in... It almost sounded like a utopia. And yet Western civilization likes to think, hold on a second, we're better. We've got all this technology. We can basically wipe you out if we need to. Therefore, we can do whatever we want, forgetting about the basics of who we are. In fact, there was an interesting little thing about Captain Cook, um, Captain Cook, as you're probably aware, is the guy who helped discover Australia and, and set it up for the British. And um, when he came across the Aboriginal people in Australia, he actually wrote in his journal that he found them some of the happiest people he'd ever met, which was fascinating because the National Geographic Society that he was involved with actually removed that from his log when it was first published. As if to say, hold on a second, these are happy people. We can't treat them like happy people because that might be a problem to us. It might reflect badly on how we're living in our society. So it's amazing what the West has done um, just to try and cover up for their own deficiencies. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what your thought is on how that impacts the consciousness of Western society right now in terms of people who were still engaging in this greed and profit-making and sort of plundering whatever markets they can create to plunder. But what's happening below that in, in the subconscious of people who are still willing to engage in these behaviors, even if it may seem less destructive, it's, it's in many ways a continuation of the continuation. same attitude. Oh, completely it is. So this is where I went back to the basics to try and make sense of all this. How did this all happen? What went wrong? Um, and it's about understanding those subconscious drives and what's actually happening inside. And what I looked at was thinking, okay, well, let's see how did this work from a friendship point of view. And when I looked at it from friendship, it kind of made sense. So when we were tribal, friendship was what kind of kept us together. It gave us a sense of safety and security. So when we... Uh, we're in a tribe, we didn't have to worry about the other tribe so much because we had people who could protect us, we were secure with our food because we could go out as a group and hunt better and gather food better together. But then we started developing farming and that all kind of changed. And then it came quite significantly bad because what we started doing is relying on a piece of land to try and keep us alive. Now, we couldn't just grow what was enough for us in just one season. We had to grow enough in case there were bad droughts and everything. So from a desire's point of view, from looking inside and what drives us, man, that just led to us creating a desire for wealth, excess, which we never actually had before. And the funny thing is, the, the worse the environment, in other words, the more unstable our seasons, the stronger that desire for wealth becomes. We certainly want to accumulate a lot because, man, if we don't accumulate extra, then our family dies. But the problem with that is, if you've got a lot of farms doing that and then suddenly things go bad, you're going to have people knocking on your door saying, uh, can I have your stuff, please? Uh, and they may not be so nice about it. So what we did from a desires point of view is work on, okay, well, how can I keep my stuff? Because I need to try and keep it in case things go bad. One of the ways uh, we can do that is by having a bit of status. In other words, if we're important to the local community, uh, we provide something important for them, uh, anything from medicine to important skill, they won't mind we have the extra, okay, because it's actually good for us. That uh, for the community that this person has the extra in case things go bad because they can survive. But man, if you don't have that sort of uh, status, then the next option is, well, you can buy help, you can use power or strength, or well, mainly power, some sort of power, 
to try and make sure you influence people so they don't take your stuff. So you may even create your own little army if necessary, your own little mercenaries, whatever's required so you can have more than everyone else. And of course, the worse the conditions are, the more these desires for wealth, power and status go up. And of course, they're the desires we know as greed. And then eventually what you have is a bottomless pit, it's like this huge black hole, because ultimately these are desires that can't be satisfied. We can never have enough that's going to truly satisfy us. So next thing you know, you've got all these people competing, trying to get to the top, trying to feel the most secure in all, because everyone's competing against each other. Then you've got these great hierarchies with a few people on top owning a lot, the majority of people owning almost very little, and bingo, we now we've got civilization. So it's interesting, our whole civilization is founded on the premise of greed. All right, We can't get enough. The top people are competing with each other all the time, and they can never have enough. And everyone else seems to be collateral damage, um, just which increases... Um, poverty and struggle for everybody else and a few people on top seem to think they're okay but they're just lonely because they haven't got any friends so the whole system is based on a whole a whole lot of stuff that from an emotional point of view just doesn't satisfy us and tears us apart so man that friendship i found when i looked at it from the friendship point of view it taught me a lot about what's happening inside us and the struggle and like you said in america right now and i can see it as well it how much of it is being torn apart because of greed right now a lot. <laughs> a lot. It's greed and fear, I think. Um, I agree. Yeah. And so I do want to turn to uh, the solution part of your um, book, and it's the friendship key, empowering positive change. And I think it's really interesting that you are a physician, you are a doctor, and you are in the business of helping people to heal themselves. And it seems like your published work is following that same mission. And uh, I don't know, there's so much here, it's hard to know exactly how to approach that, because I think that the the part of your book that talks about the rise of the beast is powerful as well, because you go into slavery and exploitation and destruction and you know, creating empires, and all of that's important, but we kind of know that part because we live it. So exactly. <laughs> maybe you can start talking to us about how we uh, start walking that other path and learn how to use the friendship key in order to create positive change in our life, but also in the world that we're in living in, because living. it is a beastly world. Oh, look, completely, and I completely agree, and it's kind of the reason I wrote the book. Um, look, you make some very good points here. To me, I look at the analogy of a bit like a, as a pyramid. Um, if you look at the top of the pyramid, the stones at top really only get there or are supported at the top because everyone, all the other stones beneath it are supporting it. So to me, what friendship has taught me is that if we want real change all the way through these systems that have been so corrupted and are so horrible right now, that the change really has to start with us at the bottom. It has to be a grassroots change, literally. So what it means is, what this friendship stuff has taught me is if there's a problem and there are troubles in our society, the problem lies with us as individuals. And in the end, what I've learned from uh, counselling and working as a GP is ultimately there's only one person we can change, and that's us. So what I like to try and do is to work on, say, hold on a second, how do we change all this stuff? Well, we know that, our, like you said, a large part of the greed is certainly founded on fear as well. We don't want to lose our sense of security because our security is based on that wealth, power and status. Um, but the, or what we're after here is this sense of safety and security. And this is where I like friendship because friendship, when we use it, can actually give us that sense of safety and security. It, nature made us, as I see it, to feel safe and secure with our friends, with people we can trust. And so what I've done with the friendship key is to break friendship into 10 basic components so that we can practice these every single day with everyone we meet. And all we have to do as a first step is to ask ourselves very simply, am I putting friendship first? Am I making friendship my priority in my life in the decisions that I make? For instance, if I take that bigger mortgage, which means that I've got to work extra hours, and that means less time with my family and less time with my friends, am I really putting friendship first by doing that? And when I start 
uh, ignoring not voting or not participating in what's happening in my community? Am I really putting friendship first when I do that? And when I'm at work and, or, and I'm bullying someone or I'm trying to get on top of everyone else or to have more pay on top of everyone else, am I really putting friendship first? So to me, the real key for us has to be, if we do nothing else, ask ourselves that question every day for the things we're doing. Am I really putting friendship first? Now, of course, the people who don't like this idea will say, okay, well, look, if you're putting friendship first, isn't that some sort of socialism or something like that? My answer to that is, ultimately, really, it's not, because all it is is just helping each other. And, and if in, people are worried about whether this affects the economy, well, if you think about it, if we all started treating each other more like friends, wouldn't we all be sharing a bit more? Wouldn't we, the rich people, be giving more money to the workers so the workers had better jobs, so they had more stable and secure jobs? And there are companies and company structures that do that, which I talk about in the book. And so, look, there are ways that we can actually have a very prosperous life simply by creating more and more friendship about us. So this idea that we have to live in this competitive society where we always have to have more than the other person beside us and, you know, the bigger house and the bigger car and, the, you know, the status in the career and, and all those kinds of things, they don't have to be there. Or we, if we focus on the friendship first, we can actually make a big difference. And even just with everyone we meet, if we work on satisfying just 10 simple basic desires, we can make a huge impact on the people around us That'll improve their lives, and then they can in turn share it with others. Next thing you know, we have happier communities that are more united, and hopefully then that can spread even further. So to me, yes, the beginning is changing us. Mind you, it's not necessarily be an easy sell. Um, I'd like it to be spread everywhere, but yes, until we kind of do that, I see that this um, idea of the wealth parent status is going to continue to dominate our lives and just continue to cause massive destruction, which I really don't think we need. Uh, I'm sure we don't need that. And, uh, you know, it's really interesting because I find that with a lot of the work that you're putting forth and what other people have suggested and ways to make changes and the recognition that we can only change ourselves can be very frustrating for everyone because we're still living in this tumultuous world. So how do you counsel people to make these changes in their lives um, while still interfacing with the toxicity? And, you know, that's in two ways. One is just basic survival needs. And the other is there seems to be, and maybe you can comment on this as well, a kind of sickness in society where people themselves are wearing masks and are, you know, sort of competing and trying to take over each other. So I don't know how you might um, answer that question. Yeah, look, that's a tricky question. Yes, thank you. Um, Look, look, you are right. It is difficult. What I find interesting is when I treat people with depression and all these issues, um, most of them seem to find that if they understand that the problem isn't ultimately them, that this is something that is bigger than them, that this has occurred long before um, they were ever born, there's a whole lot of structures in place that just really don't work, I find a lot of people actually find some solace in that. Because then they realize, hold on a second, um, I'm not to blame for all this, because as soon as things go bad, often we start to blame ourselves. But then we can also, when we understand how it all works, we can then say, hold on a second, I can make a difference here too. And this little difference actually is very important. We can set the example. So one of the desires of friendship is um, what I call sameness. And sameness basically means that we like to hang around people who are similar to us. But it also means that if one person does it, someone else is more likely to do it as well. And there are different theories out there as to how that can make a bit of a change. So it's a bit like being the the little pebble thrown into the pond. We create a little ripple. But if you have enough ripples, then you can actually create quite some big waves. You can make some quite some big change. So I think that a lot of the time we underestimate how important the changes we make in our own lives can actually affect not only our life, but the things around us. And so look, when I was writing the book, it looked pretty terrible, all those horrible things that are happening to us. But to be honest with you, as soon as I looked at the friendship, I thought, you know, here we've got some real hope. 
we can actually get to the heart of what's going on. We can actually make a long-term difference and bring things together. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that, yeah, I think the friendship, if we give it the power that it needs, we start to focus on it more. I really think even for those of us who are really struggling um, and are suffering a lot of the sickness that is going on in society at the moment, I think it can actually solve a, a lot of it, um, including drug addictions and things like that. Because as people have mentioned in the past, how much of drug and alcoholism is simply because we don't have good connections around us. And I think a lot of the illnesses we're suffering at the moment are because of that lack of connection. Uh, it's so interesting you said that because that is what was occurring in my mind that a lot of what people suffer from is because of this. You know, they say that stress is such a big cause of disease. And what is stress really but that, um, that. Dis disconnection? So that makes perfect sense to me that this could almost be. Um, a remedy to much that ails our society, even physiologically, is that so? Oh, oh completely. Look, I've been treating mental health issues now for a long time, and I have a slightly different way of looking at mental health now. Um, my model that I kind of use now, the analogy I use, is a glass of water. So I think of a, if you put a glass of water in a freezer, what does it do? Well, it freezes. Now, does that mean there's something wrong with the water? Well, not really, because you kind of expect the water to do that in that circumstance. But what's happened is medicine, our society, has basically said, hold on, this water isn't supposed to freeze. Okay, we put it under these horrible conditions and it's not supposed to do that. So what we're trying to do now is chuck chemicals in it, um, trying to change the water in some way and saying, hold on, the water's faulty. Okay, it's not supposed to do that. But look, it's behaving exactly as we'd expect it to in those circumstances. Uh, and this is one of the issues that I come across as a doctor. Um, there's this idea out there that uh, medicine is a solution, but ultimately it's not because to me, almost all our mental illness is just simply a symptom. It, most of it is a symptom of the fact that our, our basic needs aren't being met and we can't see how they will be, that we're just not treating each other as human beings. So it's one of the things that I discuss with my patients is imagine this tribal person within us, okay? Now you put them in a society that is disconnected and it's running on trying to compete with each other, against each other. How's that going to make us feel? Is it really going to make us satisfied? Are we really going to feel like we've got that connection? Are women really going to feel supported when they've got their kids around them? And I don't find that we are. Our society isn't offering us the basics of who we are. Well, that's true, and I guess that's why we need to, to bring this back.
And it's interesting because one of the things I have thought as well is that the uh, tribal uh, peoples or the aboriginal peoples are um, all over the world in every society and every culture and every race. If you go back into those histories, you're going to find people were um, tribal and in living in harmony with their surroundings, whatever that might have been, whether it was the icy Siberia or um, you know the the jungles of Brazil, whatever it was, people were able to have their societies in harmony with their environment and harmony with with the planet. And it seems to me that this is where we need to go again. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how we can bring back that tribal sensibility and understanding of how to live, even though we live in a technological age of uh, all kinds of computers and smartphones and stuff. How can you see this coming together into a new kind of reality? Yeah, look, that, that's a very good point. And this is where I actually find friendship very helpful in, in a lot of ways, because if we start to connect more with each other, one of the things we start to do is friendship is about respect. So we start respecting each other and valuing each other more. At the moment, I'm finding a lot of, even with lots of illnesses, we don't do the things we know are supposed to help and heal us because deep down inside, a lot of us don't actually like ourselves. So we can either punish ourselves or just not do what we know isn't going to work. So we're not even respecting ourselves. And of course, if we don't respect ourselves, then how are we going to respect others? And more importantly, then, how are we going to respect the land? So to me, when I looked at that balance of self model, if we look at the model itself, it's actually an upside down triangle. And the bottom of it is a sense of personal self, a sense of who we are. But in the middle of it is land. And land for me is everything that is not human. Now, for me to get a sense of self, I found land really important. It's about, for me, it was about connecting, on it, connecting with it on an emotional level, sort of understanding it better. And tribal people were very good at that. Uh, and if you look, want to look at it from a more scientific point of view, it's about saying, look, our brain is made to get on with lots of people. So if you hang around in nature long enough, it starts to give human qualities to different parts of the land, to, to the sky, um, to the earth itself. Hence, we've got this Mother Earth idea and to... The, the trees and the plants, and, and in the end, we'll probably give them a sort of a spiritual value, that sort of, but also an equality. These spirits are not superior to us. They're actually more of our equal. Uh, they're just a bit different. And that's kind of reflected in the tribal um, society's views and their beliefs and the stories and the narratives they tell. So uh, to me, when I look back at those narratives, I'm thinking these narratives are actually really, really smart because they are so connected to their land, it helps define who they are. Um, and land, I find, is a great way of grounding us. It stops us doing silly things that are likely to destroy us. Um, because if we start believing in crazy stuff, like we don't need to eat, um, and we can just live off um, the spirits or off the air, then, yeah, well, we're not going to do so well. So I find if we can connect back to the basics, just try and connect with the basics of the land, even if we just connect more deep inside ourselves with our own drives and the nature of ourself, often we're connecting closer to nature anyway because that's where just a reflection of what nature is. And so I think there are lots of ways we can connect to the greater world and connect with it on an emotional level. And I think if we become friends with each other and make that priority, I think we've got a much better chance of being friends with the world. And then going back to the point like the... Aboriginal cultures around the world were, and that's being friends um, with the land itself and everything else, and not treating it as a resource, treating it actually as something to be respected, just as like each other. Yes, yes, I can, I see that very clearly, and it's interesting because you you do cover um, so much in your book. It, I don't want to to miss. Um, letting people know more about it because it, it's mostly both personal uh, and how we can find our path, but it's also about our society and how we can begin to interact with each other as um, some kind of, of community. And like when I like, see tribalism now, it looks like people, you know, coalescing, this is my group and I have to 
to, you know, hate on your group. And that's what tribalism is in our modern day. But there's a way of, of moving that and expanding that into um, all of us. In your book, you talk about us and how we can really begin to change our different definition of what humanity is. At least that's how I interpret it. Uh, yes, that's true. So maybe so you could maybe speak to people of, uh, on that level as well. Yeah, look, the, the one thing I've learned about all this is, and what you point out actually is very important, in that um, when we get afraid, one of the things our natural response to do is to try and find those who are similar to us. So if we do that, we're going to try and find our own little tribe to find safety in it. But it means that if we're under threat, then everyone else becomes our enemy. So we're going to be not listen to them. We're going to probably attack them. And all we're doing is just dividing ourselves. Okay? And that's kind of a natural response that nature gave us so we could protect ourselves. But if you're living in a society that's always where everyone's attacking everyone, everyone's trying to get to the top, then basically we're going to be all going to become little groups of tribal hate, all trying to attack and, uh, each other who doesn't agree with us, and it just divides us even more. What I like about the friendship desires and understanding the basic desires of who we are as human beings is it gives us a commonality. And look, no matter who we are, no matter what color we are, what race we are, or no matter what beliefs we have, um, no matter what our culture has been, no matter what's going on, these basic desires are true for all of us. And what I see is missing at the moment is something common that we can all grab onto that can actually unite us. And so to me, these basics can actually have that potential to really unite us back as communities again. Um, we can actually, for instance, what I often tell patients is, look, from a communications point of view, when you meet someone for the first time, you can actually choose whether that person in almost in an instant is either going to come across as a friend or whether you're going to actually make them an enemy. And the easiest way to make them an enemy, look for difference. If you focus on the difference between you and them, then you've almost automatically said to your subconscious, oh, this person's going to be something dangerous. <coughs> Excuse me. So then if you then look at the focus of what is similar between all of us, then automatically you've told your subconscious, hey, this person's a potential friend. I can actually get to know this person and maybe this person can be on my side. So in the end, what I've learned is friendship can actually unite us simply out of choice. If we come across everybody and instead of looking at all the differences we have, we focus on the similarities. Like I know at the moment in America, there's a big thing about the different parties are really hating each other right now and they're fighting each other. But the funny thing is everyone there wants the same basics. Everybody wants a nice sense of community. They want a family that feels strong and safe. They want uh, a good, satisfying job. They want, hopefully, the government not to interfere in their lives too much. They want the basics that are essentially the same. And yet, what are we doing? We're fighting each other. And yet, we don't need to if we focus simply on the similarity and the commonality between us. So I think friendship has a, has a great potential, even on a political level, to try and step above politics and say, hold on a second, this politics is really just a waste because we're ultimately trying to do the same stuff. And so I really like the idea that maybe if we just forget about the differences so much and focus more on our commonality, we can actually unite a lot of communities much more satis satisfactorily and then have a much better result for everybody. Well, I, I do agree. I think that that is exactly what's needed. And as you said, we can only start with ourselves and those of us who can uh, create a broader influence or teaching moments can do that as well. And just to remind everyone that we are speaking uh, to the author of The Friendship Key to Lasting Peace, United Communities, Stronger Relationships, Equality, and a Better Job. And that's Dr. Winfred Senthoff. Senthoff excuse me. Um, so I'm hoping that people will pick up, will pick up. this book because it, it really is a wonderful primer for how to in a way, deprogram ourselves and really understand from all these different perspectives what a healthy person looks like, what a healthy friendship looks like, what a healthy society looks like. And I think that you're really making a contribution here with your book, Dr. Sethoff, so I appreciate that very much. And 
I don't know if we covered as much as we could, but if you have uh, more that, that we left out, please do uh, take the opportunity to share it. No, look, I, I think we've covered quite a lot, and that's really great. Um, if, if, look, if there's anything that I've learned that I'd, I like to often highlight in this is that we really don't give friendship a very good rap. Um, what I've learned as I've been promoting the book is that a lot of us seem to think that we actually know what friendship's about, um, and most of us don't seem to think it's that important. So it doesn't look like it's got much power or influence in our lives, like it can't do, really do very much. But I've learned from experience that this is actually probably the opposite, and it is so fundamental to who we are and living satisfying lives. I think we've just forgotten it, and we've been basically taught that really it isn't that important. I mean, I was taught myself growing up that friendship is has to come behind work and study and a whole lot of other stuff. And I see in our lives that's what we're doing. We're chucking, putting friendship down the bottom of our priority list. We're not spending time building our communities. We're trying to go it alone. We're trying to use wealth as a way of trying to build our security rather than each other and our families. Our families are moving away regularly. I mean, I even learnt in the United States that the average person moves house 11 times. I mean, it's pretty hard to create a community if we're trying to always move all the time. So if there's anything that I like to try and emphasize here is that, look, friendship has an enormous power and influence if we actually give it a chance. Um, and all I'm really trying to suggest is let's, let's give it that chance. And um, then I think from the inside out, we can actually make some real change that I think can offer us um, a much more peaceful world uh, one that's greater equality. I think we can have the health care that we all need uh, rather than having people that can afford it and people who don't. And I think we're going to get rid of a lot of the poverty considering that at least um, two-thirds of the world at the moment is living on less than $700 a year. I mean, this is just... We're living in really crazy times. So I think, yeah, I think we have an opportunity now to begin to fix things. And so I'm hoping that a book like this can help... Um, um, precipitate some change that might lead that to long term so we can actually have better worlds. Yeah, that would be nice. I, I agree. It would be very, very nice. And I also, you know, I really you like know, I really this like introduction this. of friendship as, um, as you call it, the friendship key, because to me that really is at the root of everyone's longing and at the root of what is keeping us um, in this state of depression and isolation and confusion. And it's not sort of the answer that most of us would think of. But to me, once I've seen it and started really considering it as you're presenting it, that this is something that's very real. I don't think I value anything above real friendship. And um, I hadn't really thought about it, but it's the only thing that really um, carries you and can uplift you and can move you through any kind of challenge in life or 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 um, you know in society. So I really appreciate that work that you're putting out there. So thank you very much thank, for that. Thank you, thank you. Yes, yes. And I, look, I hope other people can start to see that too. Um, that would be really good. And I think then we've got a real chance of making some some real change longer term. That's exactly. what I'm hoping. And I, I'm presuming that people can get uh, your book wherever these books are sold. But do you have a website or something you want to share with people to make contact with you, a blog or something? Yes, I do. So my web page is winfriedsedhoff.com. So it's just all one word. Um, so they can go there. I do write a blog. I'm starting to write a blog now. Um, so happy to... Uh, get some feedback on all of that, that'll be really, really good. Um, and yes, of course, they can get the book from Amazon, and as you, most people can, they can get it as a Kindle as well. Um, so, And they can order it in from their bookstores too. And look, if people want to share it around, I'd be really, really lovely if they could just share it around and just even create a discussion around it. That'd be fantastic. Because, um, yeah, I think it all begins with just, you know, individuals like us who are listening right now. So I think we can actually really make a difference together. Yes, and, and the spelling of that is W-I-N-F-R-I-E-D 
S-E-D-H-O-F-F dot com. For those of you who want to check out the website, I think that would be a wonderful thing to do. And the book is called The Friendship Key is the primary title. So people can uh, also search for that and really get into it. I think that it's important that um, in this age of social media where everybody is liking things based on very low criteria, that we begin to start feeding into our experience, our relationships, whatever it is that we're doing, some of these friendship keys so that even through the social media that people seem to be so attracted to, we can begin to feed some of these concepts into what we're doing, become a little less suspicious, and at least even if we hold even those suspicions, we can nurture our environment more by learning to be a good friend. Completely. I agree 100%. Yes. Yep. That's what we're hoping for. I mean, wouldn't it be great if there was no more trolling on all those social media sites, if people actually treated themselves like friends on there as well? I mean, yeah, I think it has. we can do a lot with that sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's what I, that's, that's the vision that I saw as we were speaking, like, you know, take away uh, some of that toxicity and really begin to nurture life in a way that is very reminiscent of what it means to be human and what it means to have that um, true um, tribal, aboriginal, holistic understanding of life. Um, to me, that's a wonderful way to live. I don't think technology is technology a problem is if problem. we have the right spirit that we're bringing to life. Well, I completely agree with you. Um, I actually wrote a little sci-fi book based on the friendship key while I was having it organized. And actually, that's the future that I kind of see as well. So technology supplements us while we're living the basics of our humanity and making sure the humanity gets solved first. Because then we can have a wonderful life and then the technology can supplement what we're doing. Excellent, excellent. Um, so I really um, am so, so really grateful am so that grateful. you could uh, join me today, uh, Dr. Winfried Sedhoff. And I hope to be able to speak to you again and, and go a little bit deeper in this. So I'll probably be calling on you a few more times. I'd love that. That'd be wonderful. It's been, very, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much. And uh, so bye for now, and we'll talk again. That's fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Don't worry, mother It'll be alright Don't worry, sister Say your prayers And sleep tight It'll be fine Lover of mine Just fine Lend your voices Only the sounds of freedom No longer lend your strength To that which you wish to be free from For your lives with love and bravery And you shall Down your chest. 
move out of the way There is a new army coming And we are armed with faith And too late 